Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a monthly podcast for horse racing enthusiasts everywhere. Happy New Year to all our listeners and a Happy New Year to my co-host Phil. How are you doing, Phil? Um, very well, Simon. Yeah, uh, strange old time still, still stuck at home, but uh, but yeah, getting used to it, been here a long time. <laughs> Well, this is our, our third post- podcast now, isn't it? We had uh, a really good second one with Tom Scudamore, lovely guest. And I'm delighted to say that we'll have Hazel Poplinski on later on, the chief executive of Perth Racecourse. So looking forward to hearing Hazel's views on racecourses and how, how they're coping. Yeah, indeed. I mean, we've talked about it quite a lot, haven't we? The impact of the current situation on racecourses. So, yeah, getting Hazel's view on that will be great. And, um, yeah, we've made it through to three episodes so uh, we seem to be growing a little bit of a following so uh, hopefully that'll continue as we go forwards if uh, people who are listening are kind enough to uh, follow us on their podcast platforms or, or leave us a nice review or a rating uh, that'll continue us to continue building us up a little bit and hopefully uh, we'll be around for a bit longer excellent excellent now Christmas was strange, wasn't it, for everybody? You know, they were making plans to having three groups of family members and friends, and it was cut down. It was all a little bit tricky for everybody in the country. But Christmas time is always fabulous racing, and fortunately, fab- racing has managed to keep going. Um, and there was the great meeting at Kempton and at Leopardstown, other race meetings as well. It's all. It's not just about Cheltenham, is it? Racing. I know that the national hunt season always gears towards that, but there is fabulous racing other times of the year. Uh, what were your highlights of the the Christmas racing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I, my my number one highlight was away from all of the uh, the big meetings. Uh, we had a runner on Boxing Day at Wing Canton. Uh, our horse Dynamic Kate was uh, going in her first hurdle there, and. She'd had plenty of problems hurdling at home, so uh, she t- took a while to get the hang of it. So we were a bit full of we were full of trepidation, but fortunately, after a little bit of a stutter into the first, she actually jumped around quite nicely, and she was well beaten. But um, it was great. That was the highlight of my Christmas was her getting round however many hurdles it was at Wincanton. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, anyway, you did ask me originally about the the big races at Christmas. I well, well, no, no, no. To Dynamic be fair, <laughs> well, to be fair, Dynamic Cape may not be a name which will trip off our listeners' lips, but it's a highlight for you. But yeah, let's let's come on to the highlights, the, the horses that people will have heard of that are running at Kempton, Leopardstown. Obviously, the big race is the one at Kempton, the, the King George on Boxing Day, um, and there was a, a a bit of a story there with, with Frodon winning. Um, uh, Bryony Frost uh, rides him and, and uh, is usually good value in the interviews afterwards. And um, and she was, uh, wasn't she? Yes, yeah, she certainly was. Uh, she, she enjoys her winnings, that's for sure. And, and, and he did it well, ran, ran from the front, um, and, you know, and, and put in a... It was a bit of a surprise to some people, but um, but yeah, he ran a great race. Can I just stop you there about being a surprise to some people? because uh, certain quarters it was fancied. I've always been a big follower of the price-wise column in Racing Post, mm-hmm. which is now being done for a long time by Tom Segal. I don't know if you saw, he did actually tip that up at 25 to 1 in, in an anti-post uh, article. And um, right. I say, I'm, I'm not I'm not slavishly a follower, but I do follow it quite a lot. I actually missed, missed it when it first came out, anti-post, but I saw in the morning, I think it was still 20, 25 to 1. So I'm not a big gambler, but I did have a little tickle on it. So I was, you know, it, it helped, helped pay for the turkey. So that was good. Well done. Um, but yeah, over in Ireland, there were some good performances as well. I love the Leopardstown meeting that takes place over Christmas and... Um, and there's a there's a good meeting at Cork as well the same the same time during that Christmas period so Shaq on Poursoir won really well over there and um, and on a personal note I I did back a Plutard each way I, I've got a lot of time for him I've got a bit of a soft spot for him and he he looked booked for third in the big Savills Chase but uh, he suddenly rallied on the running and snatched the race on the line which uh, which was much to my my uh, betting account's delight that's for sure. <laughs> This this is the Cheveley Park horse, isn't it? The red colours with the white sash, isn't That's it? That's right, yeah. 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 Well, going back to Tom Segal and Price-wise, he's actually... They, the Racing Post do um, Cheltenham anti-post articles, 
And Tom Segala's tipped up a Plutar at 10 to 1 for the Gold Cup. So there you go. Frodon, Frodon is a 16 to 1 chance, best price. But he's actually gone for a Plutar. I, I thought at this stage, we're still, what, seven, eight weeks away. I didn't think 10 to 1 looked a bad price. So I... I, uh, they, they'd always say, don't they, if you've uh, missed the wedding, don't go to the funeral. So I didn't back a Plutar at, uh, at Leopardstown, but I've had a little tickle on for the Gold Cup at 10 to 1. I think that's not a bad price. No, no, fair enough. I, uh, you know, as I say, I've got a soft spot for the horse, so I'd be delighted if he, if he did well there. And there were some good novices as well. Don't forget, you know, we had um, Brave, Brave Man's Game looked a, looked a possible superstar in the, in the Challow Hurdle at Newbury, Paul Nichols' trained runner. And, um, yeah, I'd say Harry Cobden's been saying great things about this horse, hasn't he? Great things. It, 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 coming into the could-be-anything type category, I think. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And um, the other one that, that in the similar sort of category is uh, Metier, who looked quite good in the Tolworth. Uh, I know a few people said that, uh, that that one might not have beaten much in the Tolworth Hurdle at Sandown, but, um, you know, you can only beat what's put in front of you, and he certainly did it pretty well. Um, but the one I really like is, is one from over in Ireland. I mean, there's no sort of prices about it for Cheltenham, but... Um, the the horse Zana Year, um, uh, he looks amazing. Uh, he cl- clocked a brilliant time first time out. Um, I, I sort of follow speed ratings, and uh, based on some of those speed ratings, he, he could easily be the best the best Triumph Hurdle horse since the ill fated Al Connor a few years ago that um, that won the Triumph. You know, with his head in his chest, um, I think Zana Year could be something really special. Well, if you if you want to put your money where your mouth is, he's a best price eleven to four for the Triumph Hurdle. Yeah, so. that that's a that's a very short price. I think the, it the, is. the value might have gone out of there, but um, but you know, I just love good racing. I'd be I'd be happy to watch him win by ten lengths. And, yeah, 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 and yeah, look yeah. a superstar yeah. without without having to actually bet on him. You know, he 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 really does look uh, something special, and I, I I kind of hope that's a bubble that doesn't get burst. I hope he carries on and you know goes on to great things well that's that that's the great thing about uh the, the Cheltenham festival isn't it I mean, you know you've got these so-called bankers that can't be beaten and people love seeing them race again and sometimes if they do you know you said Zanny it is very short 11 to 4 for the triumph hurdle which is a competitive race as all these great ones are but actually a lot of the time you don't need to bet on them you just want to enjoy watching them and watching superstars and and coming back year after year don't you Absolutely. And isn't it nice that we can? Because, you know, we're all in lockdown at the moment and yet racing's carrying on, you know. Um, and yeah, we can't go racing and there's no spectators there, but there's still sport to watch on the TV. There's still plenty for us to talk about in podcasts like this. And, and obviously our industry really needs it as well, don't they? You know, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of people rely on horse racing as, a, you know, for their career and their living, don't they? Well, absolutely, really important to particularly rural communities. And uh, we've got Hazel Poplinski on later on, uh, you know, Perth Racecourse. It's, it's pretty rural up there. Be interested to hear her take on that. But uh, in terms of racing, you said going back to Dynamic Kate, um, obviously you've got owners in that. Keeping, I don't know if you're finding it, keeping owners engaged during lockdown, which has obviously dragged on a lot longer than any of us hoped. Um, it can be a bit challenging. Um, how, how are you coping with that, with uh, whether you've got runners or not, keeping keeping your owners up to date and informed? I mean, I think one of the good things about the, the current situation is, is is everybody's in it. So everybody recognises that everyone else is struggling and, and that changes people's expectations. I think people realise that everyone's doing the best they can. I think people appreciate the fact that... Um, that racing is has done a lot of hard work on their their safety and making sure that the sport can continue and and if one of those byproducts is is that we can't have owners on the race course then um th- then we have to accept that in order to still have sport to go to but um you know I, I, i'm also finding that actually i i have found some some new syndicate members it sounds a bit strange but a lot of people struggling financially obviously couldn't do that but but there are people out there that are lucky enough not to have been impacted financially and horse racing's on the tv and um and getting involved in ownership is is something that you know can help pass the time give you a bit of something to get engaged with and as long as we do a good job communicating with people and engaging with them you know there's there's still a reason to get involved I mean have you found the same thing yes I mean what I've found is I've had a few new contacts uh obviously I'm on the flat 
and uh, I wouldn't be expected to have horses running till probably April or May anyway. I mean, the turf season doesn't start till the third week in March. Uh, I do have horses running on the all weather. I mean, I had Spring Romance who who, who won uh, several times for for Solaria Racing, which is the syndicate company that I run. But uh, I haven't got any horses who'll be running on the all weather this winter, so that's not really an issue for me. But what I've found is I've had some contacts. Uh, new new people wanting to get involved and uh, hopefully they, it might be because they've listened to this podcast but uh, what I've done is I've sent them information talked to them but I've said obviously it's not possible to come up to the stables because the thing is about you know racehorse ownership people want to be up at the stables don't they you know not only talk to the syndicate manager but touch the horse feel the horse and and that can't be done really for at least January and February so what I'm saying to my potential owners is Look, you know, hang on in there, but come up when the, the weather's a bit nicer and actually the restrictions aren't there and we can actually come up and have a stable visit. That's, so that's really how I'm dealing with it. But at least racing is going ahead. And I don't know about you, but uh, uh, I am a big football fan. Well, I say that I support Queen's Park Rangers, um, <laughs> who actually won the won the other day for the first time in a while. But well, that's uh, more, my my team's Fulham, and and they're just specialists at drawing. I think they've drawn about <laughs> the last seven games. So so winning an occasional game that would be a dream for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I have been a bit concerned, and there's been a bit of stuff on social media. But you know, all the hugging that's going on from footballers. I think all the managers are telling them try and cut it out. It doesn't look very good. Yeah, big concern is if that got too much. Obviously, football is the most uh, watched spectator sport. Horse racing is second. But if the government did decide, well, you know what, we've had enough. This isn't good. Football stops. The, the, the concern for us is, for everybody in racing, that actually they say to make life easy, do you know what, we will just stop horse racing. The others all, stop all sports, all, all sports. The other side of that is, of course, that horse racing did come back as an elite sport. It was horse racing and snooker came back on June the 1st, um, you know, before football. So even if the, you know, the bad boys in football actually ended up making the government say, sorry, you've got to stop for a while. If that was the case, and I really hope it doesn't, um, that actually at least horse racing could keep going because the, the industry has been very good, hasn't it, with the protocols? There have been very, very few outbreaks amongst sort of trainers, jockeys and that sort of thing. So, Racing's been excellent, hasn't it? I mean, you know, it really has taken it very seriously and, and probably more so than than there is evidence elsewhere. But, um, you know, there has to be that concern that there would be a broad brush approach and everything gets caught in the crossfire and, you know, you're shutting down one thing, you just shut down everything. But... Um, yeah, fingers crossed that you're right. And it, and if it does come to that, and like you say, let's hope it doesn't, but if it does come to that um, and, and somebody decides some more rules are, uh, are necessary, that they that they actually look at each sort of individual sport on its own merit rather than, you know, just, just sort of ploughing through the whole lot. But uh, we ought to talk about the, the the big flat racing news this week was was the the passing of Khalid Abdullah. I, I, I know you uh, you've got a few connections with with him as an owner. Um, yeah, really sporting guy, wasn't he with with his horses? So yeah, I mean the thing that uh, like many many people many syndicators never got to meet Prince Khalid Abdullah, but I did get to meet Grant Pritchard Gordon, who was his first racing manager. And uh, Lord Grimthorpe, who succeeded him. And that connection really was because uh, Prince Khalid Abdullah had Pat Edry. I think he was his first retained jockey, um, you know, 11 times champion jockey. And uh, I ended up setting up Pat Edry Racing in 2003 with Pat and uh, Carolyn, his wife, and was there for six and a half years. So obviously I hired lots of tales of, uh, you know, great horses that... Uh, you know, pattered, ridden for, for the Prince. Obviously, recently we've got uh, Enable associated with Frankie de Tori, um, the great Frankel that Tom Queeley used to ride. But going further back, um, and, and really what largely got me into uh, certainly racehorse, racehorse syndication and ownership, um, Pat Edry, what, you know, he was the first jockey I used to follow, he was almost blind. And uh, he was riding so many great horses for Jeremy Tree, Guy Harwood, Hey Cecil, and one of my favourite horses, well, one of my favourite horses in terms of what he achieved, also the naming of him, was Warning, who's a horse by known fact, which was one of Prince Khalid Abdullah's stallions. 
And I think I'm correct that Warning won the Sussex Stakes, amongst others, uh, won two or three group ones, was the first group one horse that Khalid Abdullah had bred by one of his stallions, which was n- known fact. And the dam, in other words, the mother, was slightly dangerous. Don't you think that's a really cleverly named horse? <laughs> But you you mentioned about him being a sporting owner. Yeah, I mean, sadly, Enable didn't quite get the three art, the triumphs, but 